I'm going to try and talk about some things you haven't perhaps heard of before and then I'll tell you a bit about me and what I've tried to do about it. So uh, what I'd like to talk about first are the microplastics and though they might be micro in size they're certainly not a micro problem and this is what I've been looking at for my research on my master's degree the issue of microplastic, the abundance of them, but also the colonization of microplastics from bacteria. And there, there's this whole hidden microscopic world on microplastics, which is called the plastosphere, which I think sounds like something out of Star Trek. It's just so oh, mind blowing that these tiny little worlds are absolutely everywhere, always around us, attached to these plastics and we don't know anything about them. So what I'm looking at is the dissemination of antibiotic resistance, potentially in human pathogens on microplastics. But what are microplastics? Well, there's two different kinds that I'm going to talk about. Uh, we have primary microplastics, which are manufactured to be small in size, and we have secondary microplastics. And these are bigger items that have broken down and fragmented due to uh, wave action or UV and that kind of thing. Now in the primary microplastics, there are two key types that I'm gonna talk about for now very quickly. So these are them, if you can see me, not at the screen now, my actual self, these are the two. So these are nurdles and these are bio beads. And we're gonna zoom in, so. The first one is the nurdles, and these are the tiny white pellets that you see on the screen. And these are the industrial feedstock to plastics. So for example, you need 600 of these pellets to make one plastic bottle. And when there are billions of plastic bottles made every single day, every single year, it begins to put into perspective how many of these microplastics are being manufactured and also leaking into the environment. And this is prolific on our beaches down here. We are finding them in the tens of thousands, in the millions down on our beaches. And I know I said I'd avoid talking about things eating plastic, but this is where you see it with this kind of small stuff. It looks very comparable to fish eggs. And as I said at the start, this stuff is getting coated in a layer of bacteria. And this is a process called biofouling when it's getting coated in life. And once uh, a, an anthropogenic material is covered in, in natural things, it begins to smell natural. So there's no way for marine life to differentiate between what they should and shouldn't be eating. And both these pictures were taken at Watergate Bay, which is a beach on the North Cornish coastline and one that I regularly clean, but you can just see these rock pools are thick in microplastics, millions and millions of them. Now, the other kind that I want to talk to you about, we're still on primary microplastics here, are the bio beads. That's these ones here that I showed you. And they're mostly black, but you can find them in blue. And these plastics are slightly different to the nurdles in that they're not used to make things, they're actually kept at that small size. And these are used as a filtration media in, in water treatment plants, waste water treatment plants. And this picture that you see here is of the riverbed in the Truro River. So uh, Truro is our only city here in Cornwall, and that is what its riverbed is currently looking like. And you can see the nurdles, but also you can see the black dots, they're all the bio beads. And uh, the reason that there's such a high quantity there is because uh, I think it's nine out of over 200 of Southwest Waters treatment plants uh, use bio beads as a filtration media. And actually using this plastic to filter our sewage is quite a cost effective way of dealing with it. However, when uh, wet wipes or uh, sanitary items, cotton buds, that kind of thing gets flushed down the toilet or there's a big storm, the storm drains overflow and this kind of thing can leak out into the environment. And also in 2010, uh, the wastewater treatment plant in Truro, uh, one of their meshes broke and five billion of these bio beads got lost into the Truro River. And that's 
some of perhaps what you're seeing in that picture there out of those five billion that got lost into the river and ultimately could end up into the ocean. And no one really knows the potential of the spread of, um, you know, fecal organisms, potential human pathogens that could be attached to these plastics. You know, they're literally incubating in our sewage. If that goes out into the river, out into the ocean. If that ends up in the food chain, those kind of pathogens could easily be coming back to us on our dinner plate. The final problem of plastic that I'd like to talk to you about is very similar to what my current research is looking at. So I'm currently looking at bacterial colonization of plastics, but for my undergrad research uh, in my marine biology degree, I was looking at the larger animals that colonize plastics. Like in this picture, you see goose barnacles attached to a plastic bottle. So, I mean, you're probably all well aware if you see a boat in a harbour, it gets covered in algae in the water. So any object that goes into the sea is likely to be colonised by a myriad of marine creatures. But what happens is obviously a lot of the plastic in the ocean floats. And that means that these animals can travel all around the globe to places that they have never been before, well outside of their native ranges. And of course, you're probably all well aware of climate change and the sea surface temperatures are getting warmer. Well, there is a theory that animals in the ocean are attaching themselves to plastic to avoid warming temperatures and to go to cooler waters, so moving polewards. But of course, that means that they may be coming to our cooler waters too. Now, invasive species are the second biggest threat to biodiversity loss, just behind habitat destruction. So it's a huge problem. It costs millions of pounds every year to global economies. And we already see the impacts of this happening here on our coastline now. So uh, with my undergrad research, I found four invasive species out of 89 different species that I identified on the plastics that are washing up on my beach cleans. One of these species was a uh, type of seaweed called Sargassum muticum. Now this seaweed is such an issue because it has a much faster growth and reproductive rate than our native seaweeds. And it produces this very thick monospecific mat that just coats the whole surface and it blocks out all of the light levels. So this is the beach that I call home. This is Travone Bay. And I've spent, as you can imagine, looking at those lovely rock pools, hundreds of hours rock pooling here. Now as a child, this is what our rock pools look like, full of life, full of colour, very bright, vibrant. But now this is what our rock pools look like. So as you can see, there's pretty much only one species dominating the rock pools. In this picture, it's particularly clear. That species there that looks very bumpy, that's the sargassum seaweed that I've identified on plastics. So what it does, as I say, is it blocks out all the light levels. So all of the rocky shore creatures that live underneath that need the light to survive do not have that anymore. And if you look at this photograph, you can see just how well it blocks out the light to what is below. So as I say, these various things that I'm talking about are, are not just you know, something I've heard about. This is something that I'm finding on every beach clean that we do. So I decided that I needed to do something about it, which is where Beach Guardian comes. Now this photograph was taken, oh, I think this is actually 2018. The years just go so fast. But anyway, this was at the start of, of where Beach Guardian really started kicking off. And we were joined by the Daily Telegraph uh, at one of our beach cleans. And they were really after a picture, you know, of the beach covered in plastic. But it's not covered in plastic that's the problem. As I say, it's the microplastics really that are absolutely everywhere. It's not totally covered in plastic, but they wanted their picture. So I said, okay, wait here. I'm going to go off and I'll find you something cool. So I headed off into the sand dunes and I found this crisp packet, this Walker's crisp packet. Now on the back of this crisp packet was a use by date as all crisp packets have, but the use by date was 1997. The next business that I'd like to talk to you about that we've worked with 
is Walkers. So Walkers is owned by PepsiCo. Now PepsiCo is the second largest food and drink manufacturer in the world. So they're massive and you might recognize some of the other companies that they own in their corporation too. So as you saw from the front page of the Telegraph, we find crisp packets on our beach cleans that are the same age as me, if not older. The oldest crisp packet that we found now, I believe, is from 1969. So that's about the same age as my mum, but don't tell her I said that. And I actually have one that I found recently here with me. So this is a Golden Wonder crisp packet that you can see there. I found this literally last week on a beach called Damer Bay, again on the north coast of Cornwall. And the date on this one is the 27th of November, 1981. So, and you can just see the colour is perfectly still intact. This one is very ironic because there is a fundraiser on there to uh, get a new lifeboat for the RNLI. With, there's a token there for the RNLI. So um, I just, I'm a bit obsessed now when it comes to crisp packets, to tell you the truth. I do have two folders right in front of me uh, that are stuffed full of crisp packets that I found in vacuum sealed pouches, all in date order. And uh, yeah, I'm obsessed, but I love it because it really highlights the true issue that we have with plastic in that it doesn't break down. Every piece of plastic that we use in our daily lives will probably still be here where my grandchildren have grandchildren and probably a whole lot longer than that. And I couldn't believe that nobody was talking about this, the crisp packets. I find them all the time and I couldn't understand why everybody wasn't talking about this. So I decided that I wanted to do something to raise awareness to the issue of this single use packaging. And I wanted to send Walkers and PepsiCo a message, but of course they're huge, second largest company in the world. How do I get their attention? So I decided that for my graduation in 2018 from my marine biology degree, I would wear this uh, dress that I made out of crisp packets. And it did exactly what I needed it to do. Walkers knew who I was. So I had some fantastic opportunities to go live on Sky News, BBC, ITV. And I was asked the question, well, what do you think they should do? What is the answer? Which I'm so glad they asked me that question because it's not enough as a conservationist to say there is a problem. You have to then go and give the solution. So I said, well, there's already an organisation called TerraCycle who can recycle crisp packets. All they have to do is offer a collection point system where they can collect crisp packets, people can collect crisp packets and send them off and they can be recycled. Lo and behold, a week later, this came out in the news. Walker's crisp packets recycling scheme announced. And then... In December that same year, Walker's launching recycling scheme after storm over crisp packets. And now anywhere in the UK, you can recycle, collect and recycle crisp packets. And it's the first of its kind. It's a nationwide scheme. And they listened to exactly what I said. I told them that there was a problem, which they were well aware of. And I also told them what to do. And they did it. And this just goes to show that if you're passionate about something, if there's a change that you want to see, there's absolutely no reason why you cannot achieve that and see it through. And that's what I did. And that's my message now is that if you want to see something done, then you absolutely have the power to go and get it as an individual. And there's um, a perfect quote that says something like, uh, the worst thing that we can do for the environment is think that somebody else will save it. We have to realise that I am somebody, you are somebody, and we can be that somebody to do something. We can't keep sitting around and wasting time and thinking, oh, I wish somebody would do that, because we are all somebody. We have to break that cycle of diffusing responsibility onto somebody else and just realise our own power to instigate change. 